Oh, shoot, my internet works still. Uh, side note on this person I'm about to, well, Daniels. Uh, during his time as director of the uh, OMB, Daniels sought to restrict congressional spending, uh, saying Congress's motto apparently is, in quotes, don't just stand there, spend something. During his tenure, he was criticized by Republicans and Democrats alike. After his first year in office, Senator uh, Ted Stevens, then the ranking member of the United States Senate Committee on Appropriations, suggested that, that suggested the best thing Daniels could do to repair relations with Congress was to back was to go back to Indiana. Representative Bill Young, then chairman of the United States House Committee on Appropriation, complained that Daniel's leadership saying, I'm convinced the director of OMB uh, is only concerned about numbers, and he has no concern about what those numbers do or do not do for the country, for our military, uh, for our security, then HHS security, Tom, Tommy Thompson, complained, oops, complained that Daniels uh, would reject a proposal nine times out of ten just to show you who the boss is. $2.13 trillion budget Daniels submitted to Congress 2001 would have made deep cuts in many agencies to accommodate the tax cuts being made, but few of the spending cuts were actually approved by Congress. Shortly after the invasion of, of uh, Afghanistan, Daniels gave a speech to the National Press Club in which he challenged the view of those who wanted to continue typical spending while the nation wa was at war. The idea of relocate, uh, reallocating assets from less important to more important things, especially in a time of genuine emergency, makes common sense and is applied everywhere else in life, he said. Uh, despite such efforts during Daniels' 29 month tenure in the posi uh, position that the, the projected federal budget surplus of 236 billion ballooned to 400 uh, billion deficit due to the recession of 2001 tax cuts the war in Afghanistan and uh the, I guess it's 2001 the present which is uh now we're no longer oh, wait wait this oh yeah okay no I'm sorry this I think this is the no. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I got this from Wikipedia. So the year I got kind of off. Uh, they haven't um, updated that yet. Anyways, so let's see. In the Iraq War, which both have ended since then, as far as boots on the ground. Another side note, and that was in the same Wikipedia, which I know I'm going to double check and make sure this information is correct. Uh, but I wanted to at least put this out as a side note. Uh, Paul Krugman, who has stated in the past that uh, MMT is nothing new, uh, was apparently, uh, let's see, Krugman noted Daniels is uh, held up as an icon of fiscal responsibility without, without having earned it. Commenting on Daniels' leadership, he wrote, what I can forget is his key role in the squandering of the fiscal surplus Bush inherited. It wasn't just that he supported the Bush tax cuts. The excuses he made for the irresponsibility were stunning, stunningly fraudulent. So for him to go and say this again, I'm going to verify all this. Uh, for him to possibly say this, and yet say that uh, monetary, theory, monetary theory uh is a uh is not a, a modern uh theory. For him to sit there and say that and say, and say that about MMT shows me he doesn't know he does he knows nothing about what he speaks as far as that part goes, because in the past he has said that MMT is an old is an old fashioned theory it is not new, and stuff like that. Uh, maybe he was thinking as in like I already knew this, but I don't say it that sort of thing. Anyway, so point being is this whole thing, uh, as you can tell. He knows nothing about uh, anything fiscal except for being the CEO, which uh, are basically there to make sales and bring in projects uh, and also make money based on those. And actually, nowadays, pharmaceutical companies are contracted to the Fed 
or the government anyway, uh, through because of vaccines, because of Medicare, Medicaid, those things, because they had to contract with uh, with the NIH or no, yeah, anyway, uh, with the federal government. I'll just say that um, to try nowadays try and negotiate down prices for generic versions of the mainstream medicines and whatnots. So. For anybody who has been a far, uh, a CEO of, of a farm, that's like to me that'd be like the CEO of um, Pfizer becoming the head of the Fed. Knows nothing about actually, you know, that's a bad that that's a bad example because Powell is a trained lawyer and I, uh, he's a somewhat business person. Uh, I think he went to uh, hedge funds before, but I mean, I'm, I'm, the last part could be wrong. He's definitely a lawyer. That's he has a he has a uh, a uh, judicial degree. Um. Anyway, so just again, just remember that anybody who has a an opinion about modern monetary theory are not coming from a fina- direct financial um, experience, or if they are, they're coming from the opposite of what. MMT says in regards to that. So that's why MMT is more or less looked at as a heterodox uh, financial uh, financial theory, which means it thinks outside the box. Establishment, they're all up in the box. They made the box. They maintain the box. They benefit off the box. They don't want anything that's different from that box, from that structure of that box to come in and take over or reform the box and that other's uh, the others making anyway and the reason why i have it on in this way is because i don't want to pay no freaking like monthly anything to, to those guys so yeah uh, to um washington post washington post is is garbage as far as uh uh anything of new uh news or um uh, political literature it's not even literature as far as the part goes anyway Kind of rambling on that one. Anyway, so I'll be right back. Okay, so we have another one from, again, Mises, Mises, one of the two, uh, Wire. Uh, in case you've forgotten, uh, Mises, uh, Mises again, uh, the uh, Institute is a Austrian education or Austrian uh, financial uh, educational institute or some to that effect. Anyway, so let's see. Uh, in a recent essay, I this person explained how over the U.S. abused its responsibility to control the supply of, of uh, dollars, the world's premier reserve currency for setting or settling international trade ac- uh, accounts among nations. This uh, abrogation of its duties is leading to the likely adoption of new reserve currency commodity-based and controlled not by one nation, but by members all watchful uh, that the currency is not inflating. Let us continue the analogy of, of see, where's that? Where, of an individual receiving a magic checkbook, which allows him to write uh, uh, as many checks for as much money as he desires. Res- wait, uh, desires receivers of all these checks could only pass them um, uh, among uh, them along to others through the nominal course of trade. Uh, in other words, using the using the checkbook, quote unquote, uh, as a currency uh, for all goods and services. Over time, the owner of the magic checkbook becomes increasingly irres- irresponsible. He funds all kinds of welfare and warfare initiatives the welfare actually that actually funds localities so it's it's self-government spending uh so is welfare and i'm sorry uh warfare except that is to fund war to get natural resources and other things like gasoline minerals uh diamonds whatever the case may be from other countries so it's kind of it's pretty much a way of getting blood money or yeah blood assets if you will um, naturally, dollar reserves built to levels completely unnecessary for peaceful exchange. Prices start to rise at a faster and faster rate. Then a reform consortium assembles a team to offer an alternative currency. Why, one may ask, is that such a problem for the dollar and dollar users? 
again, it, all, the, all this is going to be literally based on on a supply chain disruption. So we are public. I've gone through this. There, after World War II, after Hitler was downed and the economy was fucked and all that other stuff, they had to pay reparations to all of the countries that uh, that they uh, fought fought with and you know damaged and all that other stuff. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they didn't have a they didn't have a labor force and they didn't have industries. They shut down industries in order to be able to fight the war. Uh, so they didn't have the manpower to re-industrialize their, their their community. So it literally came down to a supply. They didn't have a supply in order to be able to manufacture those goods and services in order to be able to have a, a functional economy. Therefore, they can pay back the allies, if you will, back then. So this is a false dy- uh, dy- dynamic, whatever the fuck you'll call it. I don't know. Anyway, the success alternative reserve currency would dilute demand to hold dollars. When dollar when demand for dollars drops, its price drop must drop unless or until its supply drops. A drop in the dollar price is just another way of stating that a purchasing power, in other words, in other words, the prices of goods and services go up because of lack of, because of demand because of the supply lack and but demand was still up. So because demand is still there, but supply has gone down, the prices of those goods and services go up. So that means that defl- it's inflationary as far as spending goes, but it has nothing to do with actual spending is the because of the manufacturing of all goods and services have gone down. I also went through this a couple of days ago when I when I, re- when I recited a article from BLS, uh, that's Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, from the 1970s until the 90s, pretty much stating exactly what I've been saying is the fact that manufacturing of all kinds have been slowly but surely uh, being destroyed and only picked up just a smidge in order to keep up some uh, demand but not but, uh, to keep up some some supply for that demand that's current otherwise they've been sending those same type same type of jobs and processing and manufacturing of those goods and goods uh overseas but they are still getting our services in response to that manufacturing it's cheaper overseas uh but it's more for us because in some cases there's still a tax that's called a sanction still a tax and call uh, called a, uh, a embargo those things make outside uh supply more expensive for us as consumers in order to be able to buy that and because whatever manufacturing uh, manufacturing has been uh, whatever importing that happens here in the states gets more expensive because it's because more expensive to uh, import them, and because it gets more import uh, it gets more expensive for imports, that then uh, demands that the companies that import them for our consumption have to raise the price in order to be able to not lose any profit off of that of what they had to uh, pay extra in taxes for that. So if there was no sanctions unless the sanctions were due to the fact that we already had those same type of companies here and they want to stifle out the outside uh, competition, uh, which is what happened in the 70s and 80s, I believe anyway, uh, that's where sanctions came from. Oh, no, 60s. I'm sorry, 60s. I was wrong about that. It was 60s. Um, anyway, so this whole thing, this whole article so far is is bunk. There's nothing behind it. You see, so you have obligations yourself to, fu- uh, to funding a free-for-all entitlements. Entitlements make it sound like, it's, like we don't deserve it as far as people who are on it like myself such as Social Security, Medicare, and Military Industrial Complex. Being the largest by far politically, it may be almost impossible to cut any of these three categories of spending to the extent necessary to arrest the dollar's drop in purchasing power. Again, if you bring back 
more manufacturing than it the is projected manufacturing this year uh has been because it's almost the end of the year uh 2.9 percent we were at i think the largest about 85 but that was in the 60s so we had jobs back then we had education that, that was not you know break your neck uh uh expense uh things were pretty good price wise stuff like that um anyway so and as far as social security uh even though uh as a sovereign currency country we don't actually need the taxes to pay for social security we can just like congress like okay yeah automatic an automatic uh fundage it doesn't even have to be taxes at all but fdr put it in the legislature uh, the legislature to hopefully make sure that no politician could take it away therefore take away the funding for uh a and for a fund that does not need taxes to fund it um everything else yes no uh, many uh Medicare, Medicaid, they both not the one that actually need taxes out of the way either. They they both need automatic funding. Uh warfare, yeah. They had that's they 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 had to spend the money on that in order to be able to conquer other fucking places and kill more people. Because that's their jam. I'm against NATO, in case you don't know. NATO goes in occupies countries for years on end sometimes it's for sometimes it's for what they what they say is a greater good but otherwise it's all fucked as to basically by a by a gun and arm take natural resources when they could just freaking make a contract with like a trade deal with those countries but instead they must rather go in and like kick their tails because they want to show who's bigger, whose dick is bigger. Uh, it's not theirs. Um, but they want to conquer. It's like right now in Ukraine. Right now, wheat to a certain degree has gone up because of the war in Ukraine. Because U.S. told the former president of Ukraine not to negotiate uh, in good faith with Russia. This is a part of a Minsk agreement. Anyway. Point being is, because of all that, energy has gone up for the UK, for European countries, and for us, because we keep, we keep having to to uh, to uh, uh, sell our our uh, our SPRs, the basically the reserve uh, the reserve oil we have that start under Trump. Um. Anyway, so the point being is, if we went to renewable energies solar and wind and uh, wind turbines the hold that gas and oil have on our economy to make it more expensive would dwindle as years go by and we want also we would also not create as much damage to the earth's and to earth overall as far as that part goes I'm not saying he's going to fix everything, but it'll make things better, or at least be on that track to make things better. So that so that requires lots of spending. Uh, uh, austerity creates lots of murder, creates lots of death through health and suicides and everything else in between. So if I were anybody listening to this, and if you're if you got your economic uh, PhD in Austrian economics. I would think twice about that and think about what a sovereign currency can actually do. And with a full employment program, MMT backed, uh, which is optional, uh, there would be less of a automatic stabilizer on, in unemployment needed for that. That's where taxes actually do come in as far as that part goes when there's not enough supply for that demand. When you have full manufacturing and when you have uh, focused deficit spending. Anyway, so let's see. Da, 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 if I just went through that. U.S. and U.K. a lack of political will and economic understanding. 
Uh, see, more or less like less and uh, less fiscal uh, understanding as far as that part goes. Uh, I fear that the same is true today. In fact, the seeming, uh, seeming, uh, seeming. Okay, that, that seemingly seems more, more appropriate in my my brain. Lack of adverse consequences, all in long term, and advantages of money printing in the short term. Now. Isn't there's no money printing? There is asset swaps. There's repos. There's you know stuff like that. But the only money printing they do in reality is for daily transactions like ATMs or at, at bank teller or stuff or maybe giving, getting change back that sort of thing. That's the only money printing that has happened since banking with digital. Uh, let's see. Uh, to to a knee jerk response, no no are short term loans. The U.S. Treasury and the Federal Bank, uh, Federal Reserve Bank, uh, in to increase the money supply and lower interest rates in the face of uh, any economic problem. Let's see interest rates uh, that that creates more inflation. That doesn't actually take away inflation. Uh, even higher prices themselves. Okay, acknowledge me on that one. The f- example, just look to Britain. Its energy shortages have caused prices to rise. The government's response has been to pledge payouts to households. That's right. No pledge to dismantle barriers to increase energy product production. That actually happened in 2013. Last I checked, it was a uh, it was a cap on uh, green uh, green energy uh, production. Um, let's see. Government response has been in pl- Okay, yeah, we're about that. Just a pledge to increase government deficit, which requires more money printing. Again, no printing. As the saying goes, you can't make this stuff up. Actually, you're doing a pretty good job of making it up. Uh, let's see. One thing is certain, however, what Britain can do, the U.S. can and will do, is sp- in spades. Hyperinflation is a real possibility. Remember, the rec, rec span and mm-hmm, had to print physical money. Uh, the again, the supply chain was fucked at that time, uh, and I think now they've become a part of the EU anyway. But I could be wrong about that. Uh, anyway, so let's see. Uh, as prices, power, uh, powerful groups demand more money. Police, uh, firemen, road workers, etc., demand that they not suffer and lower uh, their lifestyle. Uh, yeah, lifestyle sense. The government is spending someone else's money exceeds t- to their demand. Actually, they are they are uh, they are uh, paid by state taxes, not federal spending. I mean, if the state is a shortfall because too much tax has gone somewhere else, like, say, I don't know, uh, tax reductions for bigger corporations to come in, like the Amazons, the Googles, the uh, Walmarts, the Walgreens, whichever have you, if they come in and they buy or invest in a a, a uh, state bond for investment that usually means that they put down a certain amount and the the state then puts down a certain amount of tax incentives meaning taxpayer as far as that part goes because that's at a state level that's not a federal level uh let's see uh back to our bridge example the extent the exchange value of the pound has been plummeting in, in currency markets leading to serious consequences, the Bank of England was forced to raise interest rates and now government debt has become unaffordable. If you are the currency issuer, you can afford this kind of thing because you can wipe it off your books. It's called deleting it. Uh, so the bank, uh, as handmaiden to the government, has applied the only political perm- permissible remedy that it ha- that it knows as computer money printer is forced to enforce the overdrive just to keep up. They buy they they buy uh treasuries, which is a savings account, which um yeah, that's they're they're effectively buying bank treasuries in order to be able to stimulate loans. But if the bank doesn't have enough customer base to have the money to be able to take out, say, business loans, home loans, car loans, those sort of things, they then repurchase those treasuries in order to take the money out of the banking system. It's the same thing here. So that's, as far as I can see, that's how they can control it. Um, 
But anyway, so the price spirals continue to destroy all. Or sorry, actually, that's the that's the only way that I know that they can possibly control the money supply in regards to the overall banking system, financial system, if you will. Uh, there's also corporate bonds and uh, stuff like that. Anyway, so I'm by the way, I'm seeing the best for last. So there's at least uh, one or two more here. Uh, where does government get its money? State and local governments get paid from state and local taxes. That's true. So captive property owners get increased tax bills to pay for maintaining public school, school teachers, police, etc. Social security recipients must be compensated, of course. So payroll taxes are increased, which depresses business Amer uh, American. Yeah, here's the thing. If a currency issuer doesn't have to actually take the taxes for Social Security, they can wipe out that tax and still have a funding for Social Security because they could just put it as a monetary fundage. And they can take away the tax and give that tax back to the people who paid into it, that sort of thing, uh, because it's not necessary if you're, if you're in a... If you're a currency issuing body like the U.S., U.K., Canada, Japan, and them, you don't need the taxes to actually pay for anything. It doesn't go to pay for anything. That was a safeguard for politicians not to fuck it, fuck with it. Um, excuse my language, but anyway. So yeah, the only thing you have to do is put it in legislature, automatically fund it with no caveats. Nobody pays. Uh, nobody pays taxes for FICA, and more people keep jobs in in that regard, because there's no longer a liability that either people had to pay. But anyway, let's uh, see. So okay, so go back. Payroll taxes increase, which depresses business uh, product beca becomes less competitive on the national and world market. Actually. The, the competitive portion of lack thereof is when bigger companies buy the smaller companies to monopolize that industry. Um, that's why there's so few people who are in charge of networks because all the smaller networks uh, sold out to the bigger ones. And that's why, uh, like for instance, that's why Vince McMahon in the 80s bought, all, bought out or forced out all the smaller uh, independent promotions making his the biggest one because he he wanted to become the monopolist of an industry. And he did that for about, shit, uh, 30, 40 fucking years until AEW came around with someone like a Tony Khan who has more money as far as personal wealth uh, than what a Vince McMahon would be, you know, that sort of thing. Because Vince McMahon just became a billionaire in a matter of like, what, three, four years? Um, Tony Khan, I'm not sure about that. But they have, as far as the Khan family, they have multifaceted business ventures. Vince McMahon tried multifaceted business ventures. Kept screwing up in as far as the football. So The Rock bought that. And I think someone else teamed up with The Rock to buy it, but whatever. Um, and yeah, Vince McMahon, just, Vince McMahon turned out to be a narcissist. Who knew? Anyway, the point being is Monopoly side of that whole thing is that's what how bigger businesses do it as far as smaller Communities, they come in and they force all of these smaller corporations or smaller companies to go out of business because the bigger corporations actually has more of a financial backing to be able to take the losses and force the smaller uh, companies out of business. And therefore, they become the monopoly of that city or state, whatever the hell you got, whatever you whatever you look at as far as the part goes. And that's what happened to Walgreens, that's what happened to Walmart, and that's what happened to uh amazon you know that they took out all the smaller logistics and other uh in, industries that are in, uh, entailed with theirs forced them out and they became like the top sellers or top uh producers whatever the fuck you can call them anyway so uh let's see so forget about the, the competitive part there is no competition if you're the sole as the the sole Manufacturing of that commodity, or uh, in this case, uh, fist, uh, fiat currency, as far as uh, as far as the U.S. government goes, uh, let's see, da -da -da. Uh, does not have the political will to do it. Okay, whatever. So let's see, Patrick Barron, please go back to freaking school. 
anyway, uh, so that was that one. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I'll go with this one next. This actually, this is a really cool story because this one uh, is about MMT being fried in an actual uh, country. So, let's see, Africa needs economic sovereignty. They don't have that at the present time. Perhaps no continent suffers more from a legacy of European colonialism than Africa. Following central, I'm oh, sorry, centuries of enslavement, violent uh, dispossession, and forced uh, assimilation, African countries finally gained their independence in the mid 20th century, only to find themselves trapped in the world, in the world econ uh, economy dominated by their former colonial masters. Bassett, by industry, industrial underdevelopment and a global financial framework for uh, that systemically favored uh, wealthy northern countries, even if Africa's most amb ambitious and radical post-colonial government struggled to make meaningful progress in building up their economies and ensuring prosperity for the broad majority. Today, global economics remains do dominated by a neoliberal orthodoxy that claims poor countries can do little more than sell off their natural resources and ship their labor force abroad. For Africa, this has meant even more dis dispossession, uh, dispossession uh, uh, extraction, and brain drain. But a new generation of thinkers is pushing for an alternative path. Inspired by various heterodox traditions, including modern monetary theory, economists in Africa and around the globe, uh, global south are calling for a new era of economic sovereignty, peaceful development, and multipolar rebalancing. Uh, see the upcoming conference facing the social ecological crisis, delinking and question uh, and the question of global. Reparations organized by the African Economic and Monetary Sovereignty Institute of, uh, in, Initiative, excuse me, with the support of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, will be an important site of debate and exchange around pre uh, precisely uh, these perspectives. Uh, uh, Andreas uh, Bonne, or I think it's Bonne, I guess, uh, sat down with the conferences organization or, organizers. K. Cottonbrook, uh, Maha Ben, uh, is it Gadha? Maybe Gadha, I'm not sure. And uh, Dango, uh, Ndango, uh, Samba Sila to learn more about the event and the kind of and the kinds of policy initiatives they hope it will promote. And I apologize if I got if I butchered any part of any names I just mentioned. Um, modern monetary theory or MMT plays. Uh, oh yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. I'm just gonna uh, learn more about the event. The kind of okay. I hope it will promote. Yeah. Okay. Uh, MMT plays a prominent role in the upcoming conference at I mean, on African economic sovereignty. You are organizing. What attracted you to MMT as a tool for a progressive economic and fiscal policy? Uh, Ndago Sambasila, or NSS, uh, MMT is primarily a research program that helps to objectively describe how the monetary system works, namely the relationship between treasuries and central banks when it comes to government spending, taxes, and issuing government bonds. In that sense, MMT allows us to make a distinction between real and sometimes self-imposed constraints. For example, when some governments that issue a sovereign fiat currency say they lack money or frame eco uh, economic austerity and mass uh, unemployment as uh, inevitable outcomes, we can use MMT to debunk those claims. MMT uh, eloquently shows that countries issuing a fiat currency cannot go bankrupt. They can always pay uh, for obligations denominated in their unit of account. The actual constraint they face is inflation. MMT literature uh, acknowledges differences between core countries uh, such as the U.S., Japan, or the U.K., and peripheral countries in terms of their flexibility in policymaking. 
Moreover, MMT rightfully rejects the monetary and fiscal foundations of the approach that has dominated the international development uh, agenda since 1945, which is promised on the idea that developing countries lack money. One of the liberating uh, messages MMT has for peripheral countries is that Whatever is possible from a technical and material point of view can be financed in a national currency. Does this mean that peripheral uh, countries do not face any external constraints? No, not at all. Rather, MMT urges governments to spend in a way that relieves their external constraint and addresses inflation, such as by promoting food and energy sovereignty. The colonial model consisted of uh, mobilization or mobilizing domestic resources within the limits and according to the needs of the metropolitan economy. In my view, MMT allows us to challenge this model by focusing on mobiliza mobilizing domestic resources for internal accumulation. MMT is not controversial on the left. I'm thinking of things like the role of effective consumer demand, which often focuses on the interest of the middle class. How do you feel with these kinds of contradictions? Uh, NSS. I would say that MMT as a macroeconomic approach focuses more on the, the nature and role of government spending than on consumer demand as such. Sometimes households and corporations may want to save. For this to happen, the government must generally incur deficits. That is an, an, an accept, uh, in, inescapable logic. There we go. MMT shows that government uh, that the government is different from other economic agents. It has the capacity to stabilize the economy by maintaining price stability and full employment. It can help address demand constraints, which are always critical in capitalist system. The global south has to create its own model of development. For example, one, si one, uh, one might say that the pattern of aggregate demand would be altered to promote environmental sustainability in these uh, circumstances. The MMT argument is generally that money does not grow on rich people. What I mean by that is, as long as real resources are available, the government can issue its currency to spend on the good, good uh, the public good. Taxes may may uh, may uh, taxes play many useful functions, but they do not finance government spending. Tax and the wealth could be justified and justified on ecolog ecological and equal equality grounds, but. That is not a constraint for state spending in projects considered as fulfilling a public purpose. This must be clarified, and MMT does just that. The upcoming conference is about uh, promoting economic sovereignty for countries of the global south, but it looks like most of the world is heading into another period of austerity with the newly empowered IMF attacking or yeah, attaching its loans to budgetary discipline rather than social and environmental concerns. How many development countries have respond? Maha Ben Ganda, uh, what we call re uh, restoring economic sovereignty in rea in, is really about implementing domestic uh, economic policies that prioritize the country's needs over creditors' greed and prioritize the needs of the majority or the profits of minority of elites. We call for universal public services such as healthcare and education, guaranteeing food, employment, ensuring decent wages, and a decent income for those who are unable to work. We are convinced that this can only be done with through public spending and not austerity. As the gatekeeper of global financial capitalism, we don't expect the IMF to push sovereign economic policies. We all know that profit accumulation is based on dispossession, resources or resource extraction, and labor exploitation. Pushing the austerity agenda can only undermine countries' fiscal flexibility and make it impossible for governments to pursue these objectives. That's why we think the first step to is to break down this austerity narrative and de deconstruct it. We must. Uh, ask ourselves who profits from spending less on public health care, who profits from 
spending less on education, who profits from liber uh, liberalizing uh, vital sectors of the economy. Certainly not the majority of the population. Does the IMF ask governments to spend less or on arms? No. Does the IMF ask governments to fix prices to save lives? And there are plenty of such examples. The second thing we uh, need to understand is how austerity uh, mechanisms are established in countries. Uh, are they mandated by an explicit constitutional article uh, balancing the national budget or uh, I mean, are they imposed by laws prohibiting the central banks from de from funding governments, or are they imposed by the power of debt con uh, conditionally, or by monetary institutional, technical, or political arrangements? This is where dem uh, democratic debate should occur in each country, where progressive movements should fight, and where policymakers should provide, uh, an uh, provide answers. Scholars, legal experts, and scientists have a duty. They have no longer be, uh, they can no longer be neutral in the face of such aber uh, aberrations. Struggling uh, struggles on the ground should be supported by alternatives, innovative solutions, and clear practical pur purposes. That the uh, the African uh, that the African continue is not economically sovereign is not a new insight. I'm thinking of the wor work of figures like Samir Amin or Raoul uh, Prebish, uh, although their ideas have proven popular throughout the global south. Little political progress has been made changing this reality. Why do you think that is? Uh, people like uh, Prebish and M Amen uh, administrated uh, how the works, uh, world system historically worked to constrain the economic sovereignty of the uh, periphery and its development prospects. Post-independence, Africa uh, governments made some of efforts to conquer more policy space in the world system between 60 and 80, but these achievements were jeopardized by neoliberalism. Many movements and allies in the global north have worked hard to fight alongside global south against unfair trade agreements, unfair tax tra treaties, and the foreign debt burden. But they power, and the, but their power is limited. And I would say that progressive movements everywhere have a uh, double standard, or sorry, double challenge. Excuse me, recreating the foundation for domestic social equality while simultaneously working for a balanced and non-imperialist uh, world system. Uh, the failure to achieve either explain, uh, explains the, re uh, the revival of right-wing demagoguery and the other the fundamentalist currents in this growing uh, multipolar uh, world, pan-Africanism and more South-to-South -South -South cooperation could be one way forward. Let's talk about the topics your conference will address. You speak of delinking, a strategy that Amin also propagated. What does that mean? Delinking is probably one of the least understood critical concepts coming from the Global South. Amin used, used it to make uh, two points. First, catching up by limitations, or sorry, uh, imitations, is imposing for the Global South as a whole because the trajectory of Western and Japanese development was based on particular historical and ecological conditions that cannot that cannot be reproduced everywhere, such as the possibility for industries to absorb the huge labor force released by the destruction of the peasantry in productive jobs, mass international migrants migration of surplus labor to wealthy countries, free of carbon pollution, and more. This does not mean that the global South will remain under underdeveloped, rather, and that is the second point. The global South has, has to create its own model of development, escaping from the colonial economic legacy to, char uh, to chart an autonomous development path requires delinking, reinverting relationships uh, between domestic economies and world's uh, Okay, uh, world uh, systems. It does not suppose uh, autar uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, as to often believe, however, some control over the uh, remunization 
of the labor force uh, over money and finance, uh, over domestic markets, over uh, local innovation systems, and over the exploitation of domestic uh, natural resources are all imported uh, important excuse me aspects of the delinking uh, agenda. Let me read more of that on here. Uh, I'll try to put this in the, I guess, Facebook post below. Anyway, so let's see. There's one more I needed to get to. This one is by a future uh, future guest on uh, Macaroni and Cheese, uh, Claire Mate. Uh, I think I think she's going to be on either on there or RP Live. One of the two. Reserve uh, Federal Reserve says its remedies for inflation will cause pain, but to whom? Uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell recently made it clear that the Federal Reserve uh, remedies to combat runaway inflation, in quotes, will cause some pain. Powell's words of caution references to the unemployment and scarcity that will follow increased interest rates were echoed elsewhere by prominent economists. Some use Powell's same euphemism, there will be pain. While the narratives from Powell and others simply, uh, and sorry, uh, others imply that our shared shortage or uh, short-term sacrifice will produce shared long-term gains, their careful framing is intended to mask a deeply unpleasant reality. Neither the sacrifice nor the gains or share easily inf uh, inflation will disproportionately harm working class. People and these same people will reap none of the benefits down the road. The Fed's receipt uh, recipe to bring prices under control will increase the cost of borrowing money, which is good news for creditors, while heavily indebted households that rely on loans for their daily survival will face higher bills. The cost of borrowing will also increase government expenses for public works and social services, forcing states to further cut their budget, hurting the most precarious part of, the, of society and that rely most on their services. Most importantly, as Powell himself has acknowledged, lowering incentives for businesses to invest will produce unemployment. What Powell does not say is that the pain for working class Americans is not an accident or even as uh, sorry, even an unintended consequence. As economists well know, the very possibility of tackling inflation rests on relieving the upward pressure on prices by diminishing consumer demand. To this, to do so, the Fed will curtail the purchasing power of the, mo uh, the most citizens, especially those who have the least. This is not yet the whole story. The, impl the implicit message of Powell and uh, fellow ec ec economic experts is that workers have had too good in the past uh, ha have had it too good in the past in the, pa the post-pandemic recovery. In his finest or uh, in his uh, finessed technical wording, the labor market has continued to strengthen and is extremely tight. Last September, there were a ten, or there were ten job offers for every seven unemployed people. A decade ago, there were ten openings for every thirty-eight unemployed. The data has resignations in the past months are impressive. From April to yeah, from April to September 2021, 24 million American workers abandoned their jobs. In March alone, 3.3 percent or 4.5 million. Uh, uh, people quit their jobs on a record high. Thus, for the first time in decades, workers have gained the upper hand in labor market and companies have been forced to raise wages to keep their employees and attract new staff. Wages and salaries in private industry increased 5% over the last 12 months, period ending in March, beating a 3% increase during the, the same period a year before. After decades of stagnation and even reduced pay, the trend has reversed. It is actually lower-paid workers who have seen the biggest gains with wages rising in service occupations, restaurants, hotels, etc. by 8.6% in the year, ending in March. Higher inflation is eating away at wage increases, but this does not mean lower costs for employers. Compensation for private industry workers increased 4.8% over, over the year. By comparison, in March 2021, employers faced an increase of, two, of only 2.8%. 
Workers' uh, greater uh, bargaining power also translates into novel and unprecedented forms of labor mobilization. Amazon workers in Staten Island won a historic unionization battle, as did Starbucks workers at more than 100 stores and workers in many other retail stores. And rather than traditional traditional uh, top-down institutions, unions like the ALU display a personal grassroots strategy that would or that could provide a new playbook for 21st century labor activism. Uh, mounting inflation is, is contributing to greater dissatisfaction with our economic system, triggering demands for higher wages and political uh, and political uh, contestation. The, the to economists, the sudden inverse of uh, power is, constitutes a disorder in the social relations of production, as rising nominal wages intensify the inflationary process. It is no surprise that Powell Fed's, Powell's Fed is willing to act with force to tackle price increases. June 15th, uh, zero, uh, 75% point interest rate hike is the highest in almost 30 years, and other central banks around the world, including ECB and the Bank of England, are following in the Fed's footsteps. The explicit forecast is for unemployment to rise with the effect that it will increase workers' willingness to work and, at lower labor costs. All subject components of what Powell and other experts define as healthy labor market. This is also what I've been saying for the past year and a half, two years, uh, since Congress failed to implement fifteen dollars minimum wage. By portraying inflation as a shared public energy whose defeat will de de deliver a shared public benefit, Powell's Fed aims in part to restore classic re structures. The, that it decreased consumption, especially among the workers and middle classes, and increased the productivity of these same classes to do so. Powell draws on economic economists at long standing narratives, share sacrifice while knowing that the reality will be anything but. Many European countries, including Mussolini's fascist Italy uh, a century ago, had leaned on the, these same narratives and, and policies to usher in austerity programs during times of social change. While austerity secures the best possible conditions for pro profits to soar, the majority of people have always been forced to relinquish ple uh, pledging projects of economic dem uh, democracy and to live harder through lower wages and lower consumption. Auster, auster ec uh, economic policies produce uh, Austrian uh, econ economic policies produce losers and winners. Uh, readers in American might ask. Which camp they're in. And one last thing. And there we go. This is my online store. If you want to buy anything, this is a discount for that. A uh, discount for a few of them, actually. This is all MMT related. Uh, this is all quotes and stuff of that nature. Anyway, that's what I'm saying as far as the park goes. No, I mean, uh, go to the website, look around. If you like what you see, there's 10% uh, off of your order. I'm not sure how, how much you actually have to pay in, uh, or buy to get, to get the 10%, but there it is. Anyway, that's pretty much what I got to say for the day. Thanks for uh, listening. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope I debunked enough for your liking in regards to that. Uh, uh, watch out for uh, RP Live coming up. Uh, also, watch out for uh, uh, for Macro and Cheese. Uh, Claire is going to be on one. I just forgot which one, though. Um, anyway, uh, thanks for watching, listening. I would say subscribe, but this is on Facebook, so leave a comment, like, share. Uh, I'm still having a fundraiser, so you can look, look, check that out. Also on my uh, on my Facebook, um, it's uh, it's a, a birthday month thing for me. Uh, my birthday is this month, and I'm trying to raise money for realprogressives.org. So uh, you can either uh, donate to that or go to the uh, website realprogressives.org and uh, donate a small uh, one time payment if you like, uh, whatever you like as far as the part goes. Either way. Y'all have a good day. Peace out for now.